name's Emil Grafstra, and I think this is my thing about here. Let's see if we can make it happen. Uh, so my talk is about biohacking and uh, the concept. You know, there's there's a lot of man uh, machine integration talk in kind of these um, digital health uh, and Internet of Things talk. Uh, but I'm kind of arguing along with Tamu and Heiko that uh, man is the machine, and uh, we'll kind of uh, talk about what that means. So. Uh, this, this slide is kind of uh, born of necessity. Biohacking as a term is uh, it's kind of an umbrella concept and it covers everything from kind of body and mind hacking to, you know, that's stuff like changing your diet and uh, maybe uh, doing supplements and kind of measuring yourself, quantifying yourself. You can see it leads down to, you know, quantified self. Uh, the other uh, kind of top level is 3D bioprinting. So, you know, when we're talking about printing organs, printing prosthetics, printing uh, extensions of your of your body repair uh, parts, things, spare parts, stuff like that. Um, then we're kind of moving over to the right side, DNA and RNA hacking. So this is uh, literally tinkering with the software of life itself. Um, very intriguing. Uh, gene therapies are already a thing, and uh, we're just going to get even crazier with that. Uh, and then on the far right is the DIY kind of uh, grinders, as it's known. And uh, the, the grinder concept is, is simply people like myself that want to do, uh, you know, directly upgrade their bodies without waiting for Apple and Samsung. So we're, we're doing. Um, and you can see these kind of these concepts filter down to kind of three sections: quantified self, uh, which also leads to life enhancement, life extension. So life enhancement is how we maximize the time we have feel happy all the time, get in that blue zone, uh, but also life extension. How do we go from living 80 years to 180 years to 1,000 years? Uh, then uh, on the far right again, the, this is the far right from the wacko zone. The far right is the singularity, uh, which is, you know, the merging of man-machine, uh, immortality in the, in the sense of um, your, your consciousness, your train of thought is, is extended both biologically and digitally, um, kind of be able to live forever, get backups of yourself, so on. Uh, but they all kind of lead down to this concept of transhumanism. And transhumanism is simply uh, an international movement with the goal of fundamentally transforming the human condition. And the human condition being, uh, essentially, you know, this is a Vitruvian man, uh, and the idea was it was to illustrate the perfection of man. And, uh, you know, so we have ge geometric perfection and all this, but I look at this picture a little bit differently, and what I see is uh, a man in a box. So. We're, we're reaching our bounds. Our boundaries are very clearly defined. We know our boundaries. And so, you know, what we've done, uh, essentially, is we've, we've kind of invented, uh, and this might strike a chord with some people, but we've invented religion as a way to extend ourselves beyond those boundaries, uh, aside from typical tool use. But people consider their bodies as spiritual vessels. Um, they think of, uh, of themselves as more than their physical being. And uh, because of that sense, they, they, they have a problem uh, imagining uh, more for themselves. Uh, Biohacker looks at the body a little bit differently. Uh, we kind of envision the body as a, a sport utility vehicle. It's uh, extensible, it's upgradable. You can put better tires on it, you can change it out, get a better gearbox. Um, so if we want to take a look at you know, natural history, uh, <coughs> human beings have been natural tool users from day one. And this is kind of what differentiates us. We, we extend our bodies all the time. Uh, we, you know, start with simple tools and things like this. But, I mean, really, our tools have improved, but not much has changed about us. And so we're at this point now where uh, that, that's going to change. We're, we're going to be able to start extending our bodies both through DNA enhancement, um, you know, life extension technologies, and direct integration with digital technologies. So let's talk about wearables. This is essentially where we're at today. This is the, the buzzword. Um, you know, the devices that you can put on yourself, you, that you wear, uh, that can quantify your data, you interact with these things, they become essential. And there's an argument being made from an anthropological standpoint that uh, we're already all cyborgs because, you know, we can't really participate in modern life without at least one of these devices, be it your phone or whatever. Um, but really, it comes down to practicality. When you're looking at devices, um, you know, get up in the morning and you're, you're, you're fresh out of bed and you don't have any devices with you, um, you know, the scramble is to a phone or a computer or whatever. And the reality is with most of these devices, there's an effort and a benefit map. And most of them, unfortunately, fall in the no category. Um, you know, Fitbit is a classic example, a lot of sales. 
a lot of the big companies been built up, but the majority of them end up here in the junk drawer. Uh, they'll use them for a time, it's a novel thing, it's interesting, but then it goes in the drawer. This is uh, what I call the Tamagotchi effect, and I don't know if you know what a Tamagotchi is, it's a, it's a uh, toy that came out of Japan in I think the 90s, and essentially it was a digital pet. And the idea was that it was a keychain thing, you had it with you all the time, kids loved it, and it would just beep at random times and you had to like feed the pet, otherwise it died, and it just it demanded management. And so, uh, of course, we have the Tomagachi app on the iPhone or Apple Watch, uh, which I think is hilarious because I'm kind of calling all of these oops, let's go back a little bit. Uh, I'm kind of calling all of these wearables uh, Tomagachis. They demand your management. And that's uh, that's creating an additional burden, which is why um, these devices essentially end up in the junk drawer. Uh, but if you think about your kidneys, so you probably haven't thought about your kidneys in a while, unless you have kidney disease. But they, they sit there, they're pretty big organs, they do a really life critical essential job, but they just do their job and you don't think about them at all. Uh, that's what technology needs to be. It needs to be zero management. It needs to be something that exists and enhances your life and it enables things, but it can't be something you have to manage. So, you know, Pacemaker is a great example. It's a, it's a technology that goes in, once it's in there, it's no management. It does its job, you don't really think about it. Um, but no, not a lot of technologies like that. If we think about what our kind of modern day Tamagotchis are, we got our keys, our phone, and our wallet. And all of them are kind of requirements for modern life. You would be terrified to run out the door with, without one of these things. And so, it's such a critical thing that they've made like doormats, where it's like, <laughs> Are, you know, before you leave the house, you have these three critical, critical things. Um, so, you know, it got me thinking about keys, and this was back in 2005. Uh, a key is really, it's from the 8th century BC, the concept of a lock and a key mechanism. Uh, that's 700 BC, it's ridiculously old, and, uh, and, and even though the metal, the current flat metal design concept came out in the 1800s, it's still uh, nothing more than a piece of metal, and it's got a, you know, cut in it that means, you know, basically means that you're authorized to, to go through a door. It's just ridiculously old technology. Uh, and if you think about how keys and locks work, the, the keys and locks are interesting in that the, the locks are all unique. So that door has a unique lock, that door has a unique lock, that door has a unique lock. If you need to go through three doors, you need three keys. And that seems intuitive, but where that breaks down is the fact that if two people have to go through that door, now you've distributed a copy of that same key. Now you've lost security completely because you've got keys floating around that are all for this door. And uh, it, ideally what you do is you switch that around so that the, the locks are all common and, uh, and the, the key that you have is unique and it's programmed into each door. So uh, that got me started thinking about, you know, can we, can we take this management burden? The keys for me in, in 2005 were the primary burden because I was going through my office door and uh, it was one of these that locked all the time and I would go through it and, and oh, I have to go get somebody to open it. So I replaced the key with a little tiny RFID transponder. So essentially this little tiny glass tube is just similar to the ones that pets have uh, that you get you know, for identifying a pet. If you think about what a key is, it's an identity token. And this is also an identity token. Uh, essentially, I had uh, one put in my left hand and then a month later, uh, in June 2005, put it in my right. And uh, different technologies playing around with different uh, ideas, but essentially, I looked at biometrics, um, fingerprint readers, iris scanners, and the problem with those is that, and back then, my primary concern was they're too expensive and they're clunky, uh, and they're uh, not very resilient to uh, outdoors, essentially. So if I put this on outside, it's gonna get weathered, Anybody could come by and you know wreck the sensor, and uh, essentially the management was was difficult. So what I wanted was uh, was something simpler and more robust and cheaper. But uh, but in the end, biometrics has a has a critical problem in that the body was not designed as a security token. It's it, you leave your DNA everywhere. Uh, recently, the German chancellor had their thumb photographed from afar, and the fingerprint was taken from the photograph and they 3D printed a nice little finger and put it on. I mean, it's ridiculous. Your body is not a security token. It just doesn't, it's not designed that way. And so, um, you know, like I say, RFID, it's very, very simple, cheap, robust. And so this is, uh, I, I found a chip that actually had a, a, the proper kind of protocol. 
and I bought a, a, a pet chip, and I ejected the pet chip out of the uh, injector and put the chip that I wanted after I sterilized it in there. And then uh, I had my doctor implant it, uh, just my family doctor, and he said, uh, yeah, it was just like implanting like a implantable birth control uh, for women, the Norplants is, a, is an option, but he said it was simple, so we, we kind of talked the procedure over and he did it. Um, and that was 2005, and then things kind of blew up. Um, got on the cover of IDE magazine and wrote a book. Uh, and then the book, I mean, just basic examples of how to use it in your daily life. Took a keyboard apart, put a reader in there, and then I was able to authenticate. And of course, it was 2005, so XP. Um, but you know, I would just authenticate like this. Very, very simple, no passwords. Um, so I was able to get rid of my keys and my passwords, and then started extending it to, you know, can I open a fire safe? Uh, essentially all those devices, all those things, loyalty cards, payment cards, everything there, your, your license, your national ID card, your medical card, they're all identity tokens. So essentially this this uh, coming year we're going to be exploring some interesting ideas in identity management through uh, digital implants. Essentially that's, that's the talk.